Hello everyone, welcome to this week's EKG. We have a really good case for you this week. We start with a 70 year old male who has a pretty extensive medical history with a list of hypertension, high cholesterol, he's got renal failure, and he's also a diabetic and he's telling you that his chest hurts. We start with a set of vital signs because our vitals are vital. See a heart rate of 88, he's a little hypertensive at 190 over 91. Oxygen saturation is okay. We skipped a sugar on this one, but he's breathing about 20 times a minute. Since he's got chest pain, we move to an EKG right away, and here is what you see. I'll give you a second to take a look at it and see what you think. All right, and just like always, step by step, we'll do this the same way together. So we start with our rate. The computer's telling me that we have a rate of 90. So let's see if we agree with the computer here. I'm gonna find a QRS complex that lines up with a thick red line. This one lines up really nicely. And then we'll count down 300, 150, 100, 75. So he's close to 100, just less than 100. I agree with the computer. Looks pretty consistent across the board. So we'll give him a heart rate of 90 rhythm. We ask two questions here. Is there a P wave before every QRS? And the easiest place to see that's going to be lead two or lead V1. We'll go across here for our um, interpretation. And I see P waves pretty much across the board before each QRS, very consistent. And it also looks regular. I don't see any big gaps, short gaps between QRS complexes. I'd call this a regular sinus rhythm with P waves that are present. Next, we determine axis. If you remember how we do this, we look at leads one and leads AVF. Lead one is your left thumb. The majority of the QRS vector here is up, so we're thumbs up in lead one. And then AVF here, I'd call it kind of equivocal. Um, lead two is the tiebreaker, and that's up. This one's kind of hard to tell. In general, when that happens, it probably means your axis doesn't matter. Um, here, though, we'll call this in general up because our tiebreaker lead is good. So we'll give this two thumbs up, normal axis. Uh, next, we move on to intervals. We look at our QRS to see if it's wide or if it's narrow. Remember, a wide QRS is defined as greater than 120. Ours is 106, so narrow complex. That's good. And then our QTC is another very important interval that we look at. We want that to be less than 450. Remember, if it's greater than 500, our patient is at risk for uh, spontaneous arrhythmias. So both of these look good to me in terms of intervals. Where this EKG gets very interesting is when we look at the ST segments. So we'll do this the same way we always do. I always start with two, three AVF. These are our inferior leads. They kind of go together. They're contiguous leads. Uh, looking at ST segment elevation, ST depression, T wave inversions, anything that would signal ischemia. And here we see if we look at this TP segment, there may be a little bit of ST depression in two. I don't quite see it in three maybe just a hint of it in AVF. I move to one in AVL. These are our high lateral leads. Remember, it's always abnormal to have uh, inverted T wave in AVL, so we have an abnormality there. I wouldn't call it depression yet, but we do have an inverted T wave. Same thing in lead one. We have an inverted T wave there. As I move to the anterior and septal leads, I see just diffusely inverted T waves with some ST segment depression. Um, the depressions are getting more marked over here and the lateral, lateral leads and septal leads. So just diffuse ST segment changes, but no real ST segment elevation. The other thing that sticks out to me here is we have these big overlapping QRS complexes. And I had a mentor one time that called that inappropriate touching. So it should catch your eye. We'll talk about what to do with that in a second, but nothing that's quite tipping the radar for ST segment elevation or STEMI criteria, but there are some very concerning potentially ischemic changes. And what we're actually seeing here is left ventricular hypertrophy. And for those of you uh, who work out out there, you know that hypertrophy is when things get bigger than they should, muscles in particular, and the heart is a muscle. 
And so when it's working for long periods of time over sometimes years, muscles when they are working against high resistance get bigger. And that's what happens with the heart. So if it's working against high blood pressures, for instance, like if there's a aortic stenosis or hardening in the aorta, that left ventricle is having to push really hard to move that blood forward, that muscle is going to get bigger because it's having to push harder against resistance. And so high blood pressure can do this. Uh, aortic stenosis are two of the most common causes of this. Um, valvular problems can do this as well. Uh, or sometimes there's a genetic component to this. And this isn't something that happens overnight, it happens over time. And you can see here, if you remember the left ventricle is the side of the heart that pumps blood through the aorta to the body, the oxygenated blood. Well, if the muscle gets so big, there's not really room for it to expand outward. And so it expands inward and it's hard to fill. And you can imagine with each squeeze, it's just um, not able to send as much blood out to perfuse the tissues. And this can become a problem over time. You see a picture of it here. If you see this white area in the middle, that's called subendocardial ischemia. And so with this big muscle, it's easy for blood flow to get to the outside from some of the coronary arteries. And then blood can get to the inside and perfuse this muscle in here. But the muscle in the middle, the subendocardial muscle, sometimes gets ischemic because the muscle is so thick, it's hard to get blood flow to it. So the criteria that you look for, you don't need to memorize these, uh, but for those of you that are interested in criteria, these are some of the things that should tr to trigger you to think about left ventricular hypertrophy. So what you see is big R waves in leads one and AVL. So we do have that, big R waves. And then some in uh, four through six. Deep S waves, we have a deep S wave here in three. And then really it's gonna be this inappropriate touching here in the septal lead. So what that's telling you is you got big voltages as that ventricle depolarizes. There's a lot of muscle to depolarize there and that translates into big voltages a lot of times in your septal and anterior leads. And then as that heart gets bigger, you're gonna start to see signs of subendocardial ischemia. So that's where we're seeing these ST depressions with T wave inversions just diffusely, not really in any territorial pattern, but diffusely across the board. And that's because that whole heart is really big. So whatever angle you're looking at, there's parts of that thick muscle that aren't getting enough blood flow. And so what do you do with this? Well, number one, you need to recognize it, but also understand they may have problems with ventricular filling. They're not ejecting enough blood with each beat. So they can have chest pain, they can have signs of decreased tissue perfusion, and they are absolutely at risk for ischemic changes or coronary artery disease or even having a STEMI. So treat their chest pain like you would with any potentially ischemic event. You wanna get serial 12 leads, make sure you're given aspirin, keep a close eye on their vitals, and watch out for arrhythmias. So keep Keep them on the monitor, check those 12 leads, one EKG begets another. And then sometimes they can present with heart failure exacerbation too. So if that's the case, um, CPAP helps if the fluid starts to back up into the lungs because it's not ejecting enough fluid forward with each, with each beat. CPAP can help with those um, increased pressures and fluids in the lungs, okay? But treat it. These are absolutely sick hearts. Uh, and usually not as effective at perfusing, and so treat them as if it's ischemic and get them to the hospital quickly. Make sure you got aspirin on board and monitor for changes. And here's one more quick look at our LVH 12 lead, left ventricular hypertrophy. And that is all we have for today. Thank you for your attention, and we'll see you next week.